Hello and welcome to Faith Evolving. My name is Mary Claire. And I'm Keith. And today we're going to be talking about how pretty much everything you thought you knew about the medieval period is just wrong. Yes, it's very, very, very wrong. So full transparency, this video is another one of, straight up just one of my assignments for seminary, but this time for church history. Mm -hmm. And our professor accidentally promised both of us that we could do our book report mm -hmm. on the same book. And I first proposed that we just fight to the death to see who could do yes, it. Yes, and that didn't go very well. So instead, we're just doing a group, a little group presentation for yeah. not just our class and the entire internet. So here we are. <laughs> the Devil's Historians, How Modern Extremists Abuse the Medieval Past. And the authors are Amy S. Kaufman and Paul B. Sturt... Sturt Sturtevant, Sturtevant. I should have looked that up before we started filming. It's all right. It is, yeah. He'll give you a pass. But they're both um, medieval historians, both highly right. educated scholars. Mm -hmm. And not only are they experts in medieval studies, they also have paired a lot of their um, research with pop culture. And so that peers, appears a lot in this book. It was also published in 2020. Yeah, so it's, so it's very, very, revel very relevant to... Uh, today's problems in society. Go ahead. What's no. it about? What's Keith? it about? So their thesis for this book is that we hope to expose the challenge of many dangerous fantasies, past and present, that are based on medieval history. We do this not because we want to ruin people's fantasies, and not because we feel the Middle Ages is some sacred and pure space that needs to be protected, but because the myths about the Middle Ages have a long and terrible legacy of being used to hurt people. So the book is about. Um, how we have been misinterpreting the past. And that can come up in everything from books and movies to our, even our own perceptions. Also, along with that, they talk about how a lot of our fantasy worlds that we engage with are set in the medieval period. Mm. Kind of demonstrates how much we've fantasized it and how much... We really don't know about it and we play with it, but that right. can cause danger. And misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. so. Even just the term Middle Ages is diminishing the entire time period, thinking Correct. that it's stuck between the Renaissance period and the Enlightenment, and then also like the Roman and the Empire, Greek Age. Yeah. This period had nothing to offer. It was just a little setback, and we're going to disregard everything else that was happening yeah. in the world because we're Eurocentric. Yeah. For instance, Monty, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The scene with the peasants and King Arthur is galloping up on his steed with the coconuts. He's addressing them and they're like, Ooh, look, Dennis, there's lovely filth over here. That's not really how it was. There, there weren't people just, you know, rolling around in the dirt and uh, muck, you know. And that leads into some of the foundational myths that they talk about mm -hmm. in the first main chapter. So we're just going to real quick go through them because it lays a lot of groundwork for everything. Medieval people's lives were nasty, brutish, and short. Medieval people were uneducated and illiterate and ignorant. Medieval people had no individuality. Important medieval people were straight and male. The medieval world was only white and Christian. And then lastly, that the Middle Ages or the medieval period is ancient history. Not true, because the next chapter is all about nationalism and nostalgia, and that this idea that, well, remember the good old days, is as old as time. And, they, and our world tends to think that it was like the Mel Gibson Braveheart movie. It was like this, you know, wild and fierce Scotsman who was running up and down with, you know, just to kill it on. Where are you going? I'm going to pick a fight. Glorious war. They argue in the book that that's not really the case. Along with Braveheart, the fairy tales that we have created about that time period, or even the people in that time period kind of created different fairy tales based off of like older myths even then to justify some not great actions, such as um, King Arthur probably didn't exist, but then mm -hmm. they're like, but God ordained our bloodline, so deal with it. And then also, oh, the Grimm brothers, those fairy tales were taking from old Germanic myths and then just making them a lot more violent. They were writing in like what, the late 1700s, early 1800s, I believe the 1800s. And they were taking their own 
culture and view at the time and looking back through their lens at the Middle Ages, what we extract from them, the information we have from them, is not really what was going on. You know, they, would, might, they might get a translation of something and then, oh, well, we'll take this out because we don't agree with this in our culture right now. And then the next chapter is the clash of civilizations. Bet you can guess what that's about. Ding, 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 the Crusades. <laughs> One of the big takeaways I got from this chapter is that even as the Crusades were happening, there were not everyone was on board with the Crusades mm -hmm. and that war is just a part of humanity, we've decided, yeah. but also peace is. And you can see that in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. of interfaith communities as well as people attacking anyone who's different. There was this idea that uh, the Holy Land was conquered by these barbarians, that they were treating the Christians in that time very bad, and that's not the case. Awful things happen in any war. Um, but Crusades? Not great. Yeah. Very minimal war. Yeah, yeah. So, we'll I mean, say it. I mean, we have, we, have a, we have this, again, a filtered lens that we're looking back through history um, that we haven't been told the whole story. And then the next chapter, white, parentheses, supremacist, and parentheses, knights. One of the things that it said at the beginning of the chapter was about how no matter how much we want social progress to be linear, it it's, isn't. Right. And that often when we make steps forward in liberation, the people who had all the power and are starting to lose it try to muscle up about it and mm -hmm. how chivalry was weaponized. Yeah. And they, so with that, they had this like distorted view. The white landowners, if you will, were, oh, we're protecting our, our, our serfs and we're, we're doing this for their protection and, you know, nobility because we are, you know, we are the enlightened ones. And how that eventually, after the Civil War, um, those ideas were filtered into the formation of the KKK. Oh, and they talked about a birth of a nation and the legacy of birth of a nation, holy smokes. But that with the KKK and a lot of hate groups, they have this idea that they are the chivalrous knights, especially protecting the white women. Mm -hmm. And there is like knight imagery in the cover of birth of a nation and in a lot of like slogans for white supremacist groups, but it's not just limited to the men either. For women who are also upholding white supremacy, they're like, we're like Valkyries mm -hmm. and Joan of Arc, your Karens basically are <laughs> like, we are the white women warriors, absolute gaslighting and gatekeeping and girl bossing yeah. in the worst way. And they talked about also how that has, how that language and those metaphors have now come online and have started to influence uh, perceptions on the internet you know um, like the hate groups that came together in Sh charlottesville hi so um the introduction to this quote was really messy so this is me introducing the quote because no drop quotes in this house the white supremacists who marched on charlottesville who erect confederate monuments who dress up like little boys playing night with dangerous grown-up weapons profess a passion for all things medieval, but they really aren't interested in learning about history. Instead, they want to live in a fantasy world in which the most important and most powerful people look exactly like the images they see staring back at them in the mirror. And they want the rest <clears throat> of us to be forced to live in that world too. And didn't you find like a, that was like one of the um, negative reviews that you found on Amazon yes. about this? so it was like, it was on Goodreads, and someone was like, um, their politics are clouding this too much. And you you made the comment that the language is so strong and it makes it so poignant, but yes. for the people who are in that kind of mindset and that culture, they're going to listen to something like that. And mm -hmm. in the book, they talk about how education is the key to combating this, but we can even see in the school board meetings right now, yeah. accurate education is a cause for the sword now as well mm -hmm. and it's a big issue so yeah but along with chivalry the next chapter is um, knights in shining armor and damsels in distress and they talk about how 
with chivalry, it's about protecting women, but it's only mm -hmm. some women. It's yeah. the noble, privileged yeah. women, and it makes other women Look the bad. targets. Yes. yes, it was a patriarchal world, so women didn't have a lot of power, but they didn't have no power and no influence, and there were a lot of women mm -hmm. scholars, even though yeah. they were more outnumbered by men, or the men were louder or stole the women's work sometimes. Mm -hmm. They still existed. But even in our studies, we're like, well, the women weren't writing anything, so let's not read about it. So many myths that are so harmful that we perpetuate, and even just fun things, like the emphasis of princesses, right. but they're fun mm -hmm. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and they talk, I love Disney princesses. They talk about movies. this misconception of what we have of what's called the noble blood. They even talked about Star Wars, which I love. How there was such an outcry when it was put in there that, oh, Ray comes from nobody. And how that was like a trigger for many people. No, wait. We have to have this, you know, that she's of a, of a royal blood. So we have misconceptions on, you know, what chivalry and royalty look like. The last chapter is about medievalism and religious extremism, which has been really rearing its ugly head. Um, and towards the end of this chapter, it says, whenever someone tells you that medieval people were fundamentally different from you, more faithful, more pure, less individual or less intelligent, this should raise an immediate red flag. An agenda, and sometimes a violent agenda, lies behind the claim. The truth of history is that there is no simple, unadulterated time to go back to and escape all the diversity and complexity of human life. The themes of humanity weren't all that different than they are now and is the world now only white and straight and male and Christian. Some people would like it to be, but it's not. No. So, and they end the book um, comparing some of the films, Black Panther and Thor Ragnarok, uh, and they say that the success of both of these films shows how hungry audiences are for positive, progressive, forward-looking medievalisms rather than medievalisms rooted in outmodeled or modeled toxic ideas. <laughs> so next time you're at the Renaissance Fair, and you're like me, and it's your first time there, and it's really more of a medieval fair. And you see cute girlfriends holding hands, but also people in white supremacist t-shirts. Now you know why. Because both of those people existed during that time period, and they also exist in this time period. Mm -hmm. And so when we are consuming things set in a medieval time period, to make sure that we have a little bit more of the cute girlfriends holding hands yeah, and that diversity that was there so people can see themselves because as Keith was saying, people are hungry for it and it's yeah. necessary. Yeah, the other message is be careful how we translate the past. Uh, it's something that we always talk about a lot in seminary about how we read things in the Bible. Um, you know, we spend lots of time in our classes looking at scripture and you know, how it was written and, okay, what does this text really mean? What is it really saying? And we have to be careful not to project our own values, opinions, and our current society into those words and kind of strip all that away and look at what the text is saying. And one thing that we did look at for this project was book reviews. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of scholarly reviews out there because it's only a year old. <laughs> um, so it... In, what year did it come out? Right during our crazy pandemic world that we're living in. So there's not a whole lot out there right now, but there is a piece written by Matthew Gabriel from Virginia Tech. Um, and he basically says that the, they take the important steps of bringing out, you know, our, our own mythology that we have built on the Middle Ages. So good book. The authors also have a website, and I'm just going to pull that up real fast. It's the... Um, devilshistorians.com uh, there's some reviews on there from other um, scholars as well um, Douglas Hayes says um, he's from Lakehead University this is a passionate, accessible and timely in intervention into the deliberate misuse of the middle ages to promote hatred and fear the authors meet the challenges of these misuses head on and expose them as such a style clear to the general reader as it is enlightening for the academics um, he says it's a necessary reading for our time. Uh, I would not disagree. The website also has um, 
it's very interactive. They have an interact, interactive um, uh, bibliography on here where you can look up additional resources. Um, they talk links to the Middle Ages in the news. Um, so another good resource to build up on their argument. Well, we are late to our death and dying class. Yes, so, we are. <laughs> thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe below. You can donate to my Kofi if you want. Keith doesn't have a Kofi. No, I don't. It's okay. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, and that's all. Okay, bye. Bye. I mean, even yeah, just because yeah, of trade. Domine. Dama as is requiem. <laughs> <laughs>